what is this product going to do for you? Mm -hmm. I've, you've got to make it relevant. There has to be some benefit, some emotion, something I'm going to get out of it. That ad was about a connection, a meaning, a re reminder of America, that what we share. And so it was an experience, a shared experience. Well, without further ado, going to tonight's very, very special guest, Beth Comstock. Beth uh, has been starred here on the program a number of times before. It's always a treat to have her back because she's very open, frank, as she was in her book. Imagine it forward. Courage, creativity, and the power of change. Beth Comstock with Tal Raz. Um, highly recommended. As I've said last time, it's really the synergy between EQ and IQ. It's just the best way I could put it because she shares real-world stuff that goes on in behind closed doors in the boardroom. Of course, nothing confidential. She's not in trouble or anything like that. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, this book is a must read for anyone in business. I went through it, loved it, and that's when we reached out to Beth, and she was gracious enough to join me and joining me here again to mind your business. Thank you so much, Beth, oh, for taking us. It's great to be with you. Thanks Thank a lot. You. I enjoy this. Thank you. We're going to jump right in, and we're going to talk. We're, we're going to, for those that are following along in the book, and those are lucky enough that already have the book, I would recommend you open straight to chapter three, which is in this section called Discovery. How exciting is Discovery? And she talks about Jeff and Mel just took over after Jack Welch. It, as fate would have it, it was on September 7th of 20, 2001, a few days before that fateful day in 9-11. And 9-11 came, and GE, as you know, one of the top 10, top 20 in, the, uh, in, in Fortune 500, um, has such a role, and of course in the world of aviation has a key role. And suddenly, the world is coming apart, and General Electric has to have their, you know, and, and has their place in, 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 in the marketplace. And I'm going to quote uh, the way Beth puts it in the book. In times of chaos, it's natural to feel you should hunker down. Almost everything may seem out of control, but your imagination and ability to take action are not among them. You have to resist the urge to think it's up to others, and you have to take initiative. And uh, humans, that's our human nature to just think, let me just get through this, and then I'll focus on the next thing that's changing. But in times of change, we don't have the luxury of doing that. You have to get action. You have to jump in. So I'll take you back to 2001. Of Those of us who were in New York or the tri-state area really felt what had happened at 9-11. But GE, as a business, we had two major business units in directly impacted. One, our aviation business, which mm -hmm. jet engines and uh, an insurance business that was part of uh, GE Capital. Planes were no longer flying. Flying, they needed to be insured to be flying again. At the same time, we had employees. I would say the most critical thing, employees who were impacted. Unfortunately, we lost a few employees. So, you know, just incredibly mm -hmm. difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and you want to just say, I'll just wait till this passes. But that's the wrong instinct. And, and uh, I think as a company, we started to say, what do we need to do? This was Jeff Immelt's fourth day on the job. Mm. He was stuck in Seattle. Uh, those of us who were here on the East Coast started to think, how, how do we spring into action? Um, and I think you have to fight that urge. That is a human urge. I'm, pay, I'm staying here on page 62. I decide, I'm qu quoting, of course, from Beth's book, Imagine It Forward, Courage, Creativity, and the Power of Change by Beth Comstock. Quote, I decided that GE had to let the world know. People were lost. We had to show them a guiding light. We need, and this was your concept, we need a print ad that rallies our employees and customers and says, we are strong. Talk about the imagination involved, and of course, soon we're going to get into how delicate that is, leveraging such a such a sensitive moment. Right. Well, um, partly what I was trying to get across there is that um, people need people need stories. That's one of the most timeless things of all of us as humans. We go back to the very beginning of storytelling. That's that is the glue that binds us as humans. And so in that time of change, you need to remind people there are still stories that bind us, especially a story as horrific as that was, mm. all the lives that were lost, the terror in people's hearts and minds. And so we needed a narrative. And I worked in marketing, and one of the things we did was advertising. So the first reaction of myself and the team was, 
we need an ad. Now, that's kind of an unusual reaction because one, most of the television networks were not running advertising. Right. Um, the thought of an ad at a time like that right. sounds very self-serving, almost gross, right? Why would you try to sell yourself? Mm -hmm. That wasn't the goal. The goal was to say, there needs to be a way to get story into the psyche here. People are looking for story. Mm -hmm. So that was the thinking behind it. I realize in the intro, I didn't uh, fully describe your title, and I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, it just hit me. I'm like, uh, Beth was the former vice chair at G and the CMO, just to give some perspective here. Um, I, also on page 62, and this you touched on a moment ago, you write, this was an incredibly awkward moment to be doing a any sort of advertising or marketing. So my question is, was there fear of backlash by leveraging such a, pain a painful moment? Absolutely. I don't think anyone thought it was a good idea. Um, we'll get to more of the details, mm -hmm. but um, that idea of let's do an ad, one of those where ad agency, team, look at, looked at me like, what? Like, that's a bad idea. And then you had to be kind of like, hang on. Hang on. There, there's more right. we have to think about here. Now, of course, that leads me to my next question and that you, uh, I'm going to quote, almost everyone at the company hated the idea. So my question is, you know, when you know that you have a winning concept, like you said, you, you, you had your eye on a narrative, the power of story, and, and it was something you were going to bring, and we're going to talk about that ad, which, of course, I loved and, 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 and saw at the time, and it was so meaningful, and it energized and rallied Americans but there were naysayers who wanted to kill the concept, who wanted to attack you. You know, like, what are you doing, Beth? And you know, what's your advice on how to steer, in general, to describe that moment, and in general advice, how to steer through and plow through when you know you have your eye on the prize and what needs to be done? Right. Well, I think first you have to say, what are we trying to accomplish? If, if it was just Beth's idea and, and let me try to sell my idea, I don't think it would have gone very far. Again, what was the purpose? We have to be part of a story. People need these, this, these rays of light and hope. And she's been around 130 years. We've seen things in the past. We can help, help go through it together. So there was a good motive. Um, I remember calling up the advertising agency that we worked with, an agency that we worked with for 90 years, so we had had a very long history, and saying, let's do an ad. They thought it was a bad idea, and they shipped some, they sent a stack of work, and none of it was good, partly because they didn't want to do it. And so they stacked the deck with bad ideas. <laughs> so you also have to hope you have a good idea in there. Right. I mean, there's nothing worse than believing in a strategy, but then having a bad idea. But they're hidden in the bottom was this sketch um, of Lady Liberty rolling up her sleeves uh, and getting to work. And it was like, Eureka, that's it. That captures the mood of the moment and the zeitgeist that we want to remind people of why we're here. And so, um, you know, you have to work through these things. And I think one of the things I've learned is you have to be very clear on your brief. Um, what I learned from working with ad agencies is one of the slogans that one of the agencies I worked with had, they said, uh, Companies get the creative they deserve. And they didn't necessarily mean that in a, the best sense, but <laughs> what, what I came to learn about that is you have to just, you have to work really hard on your brief. What is the reason we're doing this? What are the, the you know, key, uh, what, what will good look like? What is the core narrative of the brand, the story? What is the narrative of the story we're trying to tell? Do those align? Um, and you just have to keep working the brief. We didn't have a lot of time, but I felt uh, in that moment we were really tight on the brief. We were very clear. In fact, we didn't, it wasn't about GE's logo at all. Right, we did have right, a small little right. logo just to say message brought to you by. Right. So it was more of a sponsored idea. But that it was not the time to be right, selling right. the company. Whatever, and yeah. so you have to get very clear. That's part of your brief. And that makes people uncomfortable. Well, then why are we spending the money to do it? Is this our... So you have to work through all of those, and, and that helps your brief get better. For those following along in the book, page 65, this is when Beth had the idea about creating a print ad that was going to run nationally. In fact, just 10 days after the attack, the full page ad appeared in major newspapers, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and it wasn't long before the emails started to pour in. 
that from from proud employees, I'm sure suppliers, retail, from the universe, and GE as it you know in, in itself at the time was employing over 300,000 people, and describe what happened, the emails, and the story about walking on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Yeah, well, let me recap again what the ad was. It was a print ad we put in all the major newspapers. It was a sketch of Lady Liberty getting off her pedestal, rolling up her sleeves, and I'm going to show it just for those watching on video. This was the ad. Yeah, yeah. and uh, okay. I, I actually forget exactly what the words were, but yeah. I'm glad you have it. Because okay, of course. It says, we will roll up our sleeves, we will move forward together, we will overcome, we will never forget. Yeah. Message from GE. Yeah. And, of course, the illustration is Lady Liberty, but with power. Right. With, with with force, and, um, resilience. When we first ran it, um, and even before, well, first I have to say, my new boss, Jeff Immelt, was without him as a champion, this never would have happened. Yeah. He was he had gotten back by then from um, from the West Coast, where right. he was he had been stuck for a while, and said, "We have to do this. Like this, this captures it." Uh, I had to go to him with some confidence. I couldn't go and say, mm, I don't know, what do you think? Because he was new in the job. Right. He hadn't overseen advertising. He didn't know. So I had to go in and say, here's the reasons to do it. He wanted to poll a couple of executives just to make sure. And most Which, of, of course, is so scary. Right. because And most of that, you know, he said to me, ask so-and-so. He asked so-and-so. And the reaction was not very good. Like, again, why are we doing this? This will, perhaps this will make our customers mad. It's usually what any business goes to first. Uh, will our employees like this? Will we look stupid for doing this? All those things that naturally come mm -hmm. and really sticking your neck out there. And again, we had to, I ended up doing a lot of the explaining of this isn't about us. This is about putting a story in the zeitgeist that we can help facilitate, right. but we just feel people need this. People want this. They want this story. And so, um, you know, the people were like, well, okay, but I think, you know, the, the feedback yeah. was, I don't think it's going to be successful, but okay. <laughs> and so it's one of those, I have learned this throughout my career on that precipice of being part of a new idea, of pitching something, and you don't get the feedback you want. And especially learned out of a, com a career early in communications and public relations. Mm -hmm waiting up for the news article to come out at that time in the newspaper the next morning is a horrible, horrible, lonely, miserable night <laughs> because you have no control and you don't know what it's going to say. That was, I was very reminded of that. I knew what it was going to say, but I didn't know the reaction. And, um, and so there, um, there we were, we walked, uh, happened to, that day that it came or the next day that it came out, we, the uh, New York Stock Exchange reopened. I went with Jeff and Bob Wright, who was the chairman of NBC at the time, and we toured the toured the, the stock exchange. Mm -hmm. I remember, I mean, it was still smoldering. Right, it was right there in downtown it. Manhattan. It was, but everybody was rallying. We wanted yeah. to rally to get business back, rally to get the country back. So we felt this in just in, intuitively. And walking around the floor of the exchange, people had the ads, uh, the traders, the runners, just every part of the stock exchange had the ad, the New York Daily News, the New York Post, right. taped up in the news uh, booths, the kiosk selling newspapers, it was taped up. And we all just shared that moment. And I was really proud, not that we did it or that our team rallied, that we were part of just a collective moment. And the message I want to say, and I believe this just, I think it's business's responsibility, I think it's marketing's responsibility within business, is sometimes you have to remember you're bigger than just your business. And you can be a vehicle for meaning. And at that moment, it was about meaning. And we were all connected to that story. And so there were a lot of naysayers, this isn't going to sell us anything, whatever, embarrass us. All that may have happened in some corners, but it meant enough that it, it worked. And to touch on a point you just mentioned, we weren't selling light bulbs or jet engines, I'm quoting from the book. We were selling leadership, optimism, America. Yeah. And so the, I, I'm going to lead in with my next question is that I'd in like us to be selling America a little bit more again yeah. these days. I mean, yeah. such an opportunity, right? That it's a story that brings us all yes. together. And all Sorry, together. A hundred percent. And in fact, in general, how important is it to sell experience rather than uh, actual product? Yeah, I'm a big believer um, that really experience, yes. And maybe I'd even use another word, uh, outcome. What do 
what is this product going to do for you? Mm -hmm. I've, you've got to make it relevant. There has to be some benefit, some emotion, something I'm going to get out of it. That ad was about a connection, a meaning, a re reminder of America, that what we share. And so it was an experience, a shared experience. And I have just time and time again, I've seen those are much more powerful. And it goes against most people's business right. common sense right. and their logical brain. What I'm talking about is emotion and emotion sells. It does. But more than that, emotion connects and emotion when it's tethered to a story really connects. And so I often found in the course of a marketing career, one of the things I really worked on at GE was to get marketing at the beginning of the equation. What does that mean? Not just the team that does the ads or has a press release at the end, mm -hmm. the team that's understanding where's the market going? What are the trends? What are the insights? And that's part of it. Um, too often I found business teams would come in, we have, a, we have a product, now get us a story. No, you have a story, now let's get the product. And so often you had to work in that process to say, what's your story? Why us? Why now? Why should someone buy from us versus somewhere else? Mm -hmm. And all within those questions I've just asked you, there's a story waiting to be told. There probably already is a story that's there and just needs to be brought to life. And, and you know, and, and again, the honor of having you on the set here, I'm going to stay on the subject of marketing and advertising. Perhaps you could even outline some key steps that are critical to crafting a great marketing campaign. Well, I think one, I, I started my career a couple of decades ago, and a lot has changed. When I started my career, we had the luxury of taglines that people remembered and 30 and 60 second television spots. I mean, some of those still work, but the reality is messages move much more quickly. Yeah, yeah. And you need to tell them in so many different dimensions. Yeah. So I think that's, um, that's kind of the first thing I would say is be ready for a lot of trial and error. Be ready for a lot of different ways to get your message out. There isn't just one media, uh, one medium among the media. But the first critical thing you have to say is, what is uh, back to what I said, what is your story? Why? Why you? Why your business? If, that, if you can't answer that question, why you? Why your offer? then no matter what story you put together is not going to ring true. So that's always where I encourage people to start. And then the various media the, right. the, that you can use start to, some are better than others, given what you're trying to accomplish with that story. But that's always where I, where I start. Here's a key question that, of course, I mean, every marketing and advertising agency or executive has dealt with. Um, and, of course, it goes back to even the beginning of the interview. A campaign's underway, you know you're on message, you're on target. However, there's pressure and lack of trust from others on the team. And my example is you feel like the pilot in the cockpit flying through turbulence. You know what you're doing, others can't see it. What's your recommendation to like say, you know, please give me my space. I know what I'm doing. You just have to be a little patient and you'll see daylight on this. But you know, just give me my space. I know what I'm doing. Yeah, yes, yeah, so that's such a good uh, example. You speak with experience, I can tell. Thank you. <laughs> it sounds like you've been a pilot many, many times. <laughs> Thank you. I call it fog flying, right? right? You're flying through the fog. And um, the first thing I usually say, to, I mean, it depends on how well. If it's a client, uh, you have to be, a, you know, yeah. uh, think about your language. But I remember once a colleague of mine <laughs> ran one of the business divisions, and he said, I don't like that campaign. Um, and I, I had to stop and go, with all due respect, you're not the target audience. Here's who we're trying to reach. Here's why. It, it's not for you. It's not for, for even people in business like you. And so I think sometimes you have to pull yourself back. We all have an opinion about popular culture. We all have an opinion of what we see in media. We like ads. It's the Super Bowl, right? The half right. of the beauty of the Super right. Bowl these days is rating the ads. What's right. up, what's That's down? Right. Because That's we're right. all experts at media, we think. <laughs> but leave it to the experts. And I think that's what I think you have to say is just go back to maybe you don't need to use it. You know, you need to say with all due respect, you're not the audience. Right. But let me explain to you the audience. Let me explain to you what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I also think it's really helpful to have done some tests um, I'm still big on focus groups and samples. I'm really big on A-B testing where, and I think especially in the, the days of social media, now in the, the era of social media, you mm -hmm. can do this very cheaply. It's not like a lot of money. Ten years ago, it cost a lot of money. Today, right. not. Or you can test copy. You can test headlines. Let me try this headline versus that. 
so that then you can come back armed with, to some of the naysayers with some data that says we tested it with this subgroup of customers. Mm -hmm. I also think it's good to have an advisory council or some kind of group of your customers that you that sign up to be right. a guinea pig and be give you feedback. Um, that way with certainty, it's not just like if I had gone into, let's say, the aviation team and said, you know, I tested this with consumers, they'd be like, well, I don't care unless you can t tested it with the heads of airlines mm -hmm. or the buying team at Delta. So I, you have to be also careful of who you're testing it with so that you're buying the credibility. But a little test goes a long way. And the last thing I'd say is um, hopefully you've led your team along the way. Um, it's rare that I think you would just launch a Super Bowl ad and put all your money, money behind one thing. I think start small. Okay. Do local media. Do a little bit of social media. That adds to your testing rather than putting all your money and saying, we're just going to put this message behind one. So by the time you get to the crescendo, you've got the wind behind your back. You've got the confidence and the proof you need. And just to clarify, when we say start small, I want to just uh, put it out there. Not too small that you can't tell us. Some people might say, okay, I'll run one oh, ad right. and great see point. if I get yeah, great 400 calls. <laughs> great point. And it's relative to your right. to your business and what you right. want to do. I mean, it's again about... It's all so advertising and messaging still is the you know reach and frequency, how often you say it and how wide your, your reach is. Right. And social media is great, but it's a narrow audience right. usually. On the flip side, how patient should a company be after launching a campaign? You know, what time frame do they need in order to assess if it's actually pulling, if it's working? Yeah, I, I feel like I should ask you that question. I'd love your <laughs> answers to this as well. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's hard to say. I think okay. every can and th there, people have different advice, and you know every business school has textbooks on this. But I think it's really hard to have a definitive rule of thumb. Um, I would err on the side of being more patient than most companies are willing to be. And, That's a great, um, that a great would really way of putting just be it. My, be my yeah. answer. If you have no encouraging signs, then probably it's time to kill it. But if it's encouragement, you just haven't gotten the reach, there are ways to amplify. So be clear of why you're killing it and why you're, is it because the CFO says we don't have enough money right. to go to the so next So then phase? that's influencing, right. a, 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 but it's not, a, it's not a correct opinion. It's just, it's being influenced because of financial matters. Mm -hmm. But if you had more length, you would see daylight on that campaign. Right. And so again, I think data helps the CFO see it. And right. hopefully you've gotten a certain commitment leading up to that. Right. And you need to see it see it through. Um, you're, you're also trying to prove a lot of things that you don't know. Uh, you don't know what would have happened if you hadn't done the ad campaign. And that's right. a hard place. I don't know. How do you answer that question? Well, <laughs> I was going to say, as the host of the show, I have the luxury of, of dodging. But no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you really took the words out of my mouth. And that is, there is no definitive answer on this. It depends on the type, depends on the reach, depends on the budget. You know, many. That's why really one of the first questions that come up is, What's your budget? And it's not because I'm trying to, you know, to, to dig into your pockets. I just, I need to know what, and the way I'll always say it is, how much fuel do you have for the plane? So if you have X amount of fuel, I could fly it to Chicago. You put more fuel in the plane, I could fly it to L.A. You tell me, based on your budget, we'll then craft the, the, the campaign to work within your budget. Sometimes a, a, a proper response, a client will say, listen, show me, put down on paper what you envision, and then I'll see if I have the money. So I, I'll say that's a correct response, but we shouldn't waste time. Right. That means you have, I don't want to say carte blanche budget, but you have, you're, you're thinking, you know, it's not just ten dollars or $20,000. You have 100000 or 200000 or much more, whatever the case is. We'll craft that now, you know, that, that, that structure. But do you really have the fuel for that? I love the way you put that. I mean, you keep coming back to these airline analogies, yeah. but I, 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 as a, as a well-honed pilot, you would, of course, ask that. And I think what you're doing is, Again, you're back to that clarity of the brief. If you don't have, if you're not committed to flying to Chicago, maybe you can't fly all the way to LA. But if you're not committed to at least flying to Chicago, then just don't get in. Don't fly. Yeah. And I think that's often the debate. You still have people who think it's a waste of money. They don't get right. it, um, and so their expect their expectations are bigger. They thought that with that money they'd get to LA, but you told them in the beginning you're only going to get to Chicago. By the way, whenever I'm in the room with a prospect, a client. And the conversation is, I don't know if marketing works. That conversation, I actually, and I'm not 
I don't consider myself a snob. I'm, you know, a polite person. But that conversation I don't get into. I'm like, you could read Beth's book, I'll recommend, or Ogilvy on advertising. Read books about the power of marketing. I don't want to be in the room just being defensive about. But if your question is, I understand that marketing is key, is critical. I just need to know what I have to do. Oh, yeah, my hands are, I want to be part of that. But to be defensive, oh, marketing doesn't work. I'm like, come on. Yeah, that's another great point. I, I, as somebody who spent so much time in my career talking to business professors, talking to consultants, always trying to come back to the naysayers uh, to prove that marketing works as opposed to, well, sometimes you can't help it. Yeah, you know, maybe it's just a personal run by opinion that person or whatever. Or your yeah. your finance team, I don't want to always, finance can be a great partner, but, but you have to have that core belief that this is going to work. Right. And otherwise... Right, that has to be the atmosphere. Otherwise, right. there's no oxygen in, right. in that atmosphere. It's always a tremendous treat and an honor to have Beth Comstock in studio. Beth, uh, the former vice chair of General Electric and CMO, among many other titles, and at NBC, CNN, um, a storied career. And really, to have you join on the stage is, is very special. Thank you. Thank it's you. Great to be here. Thank you. So I'll jump right in. We're talking about marketing, advertising and marketing. Is there a way, and I'm sorry if it's a tricky question, is there a way to assess the ROI, the return, the value on a, uh, perhaps we will split the question for a branding campaign and the same question for a direct response campaign? I think direct response is much easier to assess um, because you, uh, I mean, by now, the direct marketing um, process is pretty well honed. Uh, mm -hmm. we've, got, we've had a lot of good science and art. And so I think we, we know w with the rise of digital, we, we tend to know if you reach a certain number of people, you, whether it's email opened or response to an ad or, you know, that you want action. Usually you're, you're getting action. Mm -hmm. It may not always lead to sales, but you, action generally gives you a confidence that something's happening. More and more you're able to know when sales are happening. Um, for branding, less so. And branding, I feel, is a little bit more of a faith-based uh, marketing effort. Um, but I think it's essential. And I, it's one of those things where you're trying to prove the absence of it. Um, and it's what I used to always say to people, to me, branding is about just carving a little piece in, in someone's brain cell a little part of their their awareness and their familiarity that you exist and that they they know what you do and they care about what you do and that takes time especially today um so it's harder to prove it takes longer uh it's a more patient act um and both i think work well together i think it's really hard to have just direct response without mm -hmm. some understanding imagine i just knock at your door mm -hmm. hi i'm beth would you would you buy my light bulb? You'd be like, Beth's light bulb? What, what credibility do you, do you have? Right. Hi, I'm GE. Would you buy my light bulb? Oh, Correct. GE, Oof. you've right. been around for 130 years. Thomas Edison, like right. he started your company. I believe you, you can make a good light bulb. That was 130 year earned brand right. value. Um, and and you, I always challenge people, what car are you driving? What computer are you using? What shoes are you wearing? Right. There is a segment that that doesn't matter, but most other segments, right. they are brand consumers. They have an affinity. I'm on the board of Nike. Right. People are passionate about the Nike brand. I use Apple computers. People are passionate That's about right. Apple. Yes, they're great products, but they stand for something more. And it's back to story. And that's what branding does is it builds your story. So, yes, there is an ROI, but I'm not going to be able to give it to you right away. Oh, uh, you answer each one so uh, so <laughs> hit the nail on the head. Perhaps you could describe the optimal synergy that's required between sales and marketing, those two departments. Uh, boy, you and I could have a whole show just <laughs> on the tension. I've, I've never worked in a company where there wasn't tension between sales and marketing. Yeah. And what's the tension about? I, I find uh, uh, sales is at the front line with the customer. Marketing wants to get in the brain of the customer. And right there is a tension point. Sales says, no, but that's my customer. I'll do it. But marketing's like, but no, I got to go direct. If right. I go through you. So there's always these tensions. Mm -hmm. I, I keep coming back to what what is the company trying to accomplish? What's the mission? What's the purpose? Mm -hmm. um, and you have to keep bringing the teams together uh, and not fight over the customer. The, 
the company owns the customer. Right. Um, one of my most favorite lines is okay. of business is from Peter Drucker, okay. uh, circa 1952 or something, sure. where he said, without a customer, there is no business. Right. And so if you just go ground but yourself back to that, everybody's about the customer. Sales, what are you doing? Marketing, what are you doing? How do we share um, metrics, which is often where things also, you know, who's getting incented, who's not. Right. But it's a process. What's your opinion, Beth, on using mascots in marketing campaigns? I mean, there are famous examples. Geico has the gecko. Yeah. What's your opinion on that? Um, I think if it works, go for it. Uh, I um, Again, you're trying to carve a little a little piece mm -hmm. of a neuron, you know, maybe mm -hmm. take a neuron up there. And if somebody remembers a gecko for Geico, great. Now they have to be clever. Mm -hmm. uh, you might even argue maybe they don't have to be that clever. If it's just so memorable, you're like, you know, why is Apple out using a plum? I don't get it, but I remember it. <laughs> um, so you're, again, trying to break through the clutter. Um, personally, I think you have to be thoughtful. And yet again, you have to be patient. Look at how long Geico has worked with the gecko. That's right. It's that's right. Kind of it wasn't thing, immediate. Right? Yeah. Uh, Aflac, the duck. I mean, right. um, I, and so I think you have to stick with these things and they have to be reborn and be relevant for the time. For the time. We, had, we had Linda Kaplan Thaler on the mm -hmm. show and she talked about development. That was her. The duck. That was her, yeah. yeah. What advice uh, do you have on how to educate a target market when you know through polling or your gut or others on the team? that the audience has a predetermined uh, already uh, doubts about the product or the service. This is a rather a really tricky good. question. Yeah. You're, you're, you're fog flying. You're running into, but you know you have something that's great, a product. You have to get it to there. You know that once they, once they try it out, they'll be believers, but you're running into that, into that turbulence. You know that through polling and everything else, that it, the messaging is not is is, is you're going to run into up, you know some difficulty on the messaging we initially. Could, we could have another class in this one. <laughs> I um I I I'm big on just I think marketing is about segmentation. So just because you've d determined your segment of the market that you you are ready to serve and you re learn they're not ready for you, keep segmenting, going finer, finer. I think you have to spend a lot of time wallowing in that market and understanding. You have to face the reality of why they're not ready for you. And unfortunately, sometimes you have to come back and say our product is not, there's not a product market fit. Mm. So then are we targeting the wrong market? Is there a different market? If the product market's fit is right, they just don't know how to get it, then I think you need to work on much more experience-based, trial offers, um, showing up in crazy places. At GE, one of the things we believed is we had to surprise people. If we just showed up in business publications, they expected us to be there. Business to business, I said, doesn't have to be boring to boring. You know, B to B <laughs> is business to business. It doesn't have to be boring to boring. So we would show up and with stories and messages and experiences that people didn't expect. So that may be another way to, you know, show up in a way people are going to be surprised right. to Catch see Catch them there. off guard and right. they're like, whoa. Yeah. Any suggestions on how to make a campaign or a concept go viral? I mean, years ago, there was the Ice Bucket yeah. Challenge. You know. If I knew the answer, <laughs> boy, I, w I would be happy to share it. Uh, I don't. I think uh, most of these things are luck uh, and really good preparation. And so, um, you know, there are a lot of ways you can amplify. There are a number of influencers and all kinds of things that people are using. But here's what it says. Don't try to replicate somebody else's campaign. Don't go out and do your own ice bucket challenge. Right, right. You're not going to be that successful. Um, so part of it is in the uniqueness of what you're trying to do. Is it aligned with the zeitgeist of the moment? Is it is it conveying a message of something people want to act crazy? They want to. They want. Or, I can't believe he did that. I, I, she did that. Ellen DeGeneres just dunked ice water on her head. Right. That is outrageous. Um, so I think you have to spend a lot of time and it has to be sincere and you have to be willing to see it through. Beth Comstock, the former vice chair of General Electric, CMO. And of course, we're talking about her her latest release. Uh, we put you on the spot. You're working on anything else? Um, I'm not right now. I'm in discovery mode right now. <laughs> discovery. We're going to get to that if we have time, and we certainly hope to get to it. Um, her book is Imagine It Forward, Courage, Creativity, and the Power of Change, a must-read for anyone in the business world. It's available at bookstores nationwide and, of course, on Amazon. Um, Beth, let's jump right in, still on the topic of advertising and marketing. How often do you recommend that a company embark on a complete rebranding effort? Um, 
I don't think there's a, pe a calendar you could say you must do it. I, I think when you feel that your message isn't resonating with the market, that your customers are, are, con are confused, and most importantly, if your employees are confused. I'm a big believer that if you're brand your campaign message does not resonate inside it will never resonate outside so i think you just need to keep pulsing internally and see if employees are, are connecting with customers in the right way if not you need a reboot now here's an interesting one uh, around 20 years ago i mean the example that i remember was uh, fedex when federal express went to fedex where they they radically changed the logo but kept the colors are there any types of tips you could share when a company should should like throw out the old and completely blow up the old and create a new or when it should just be a gradual tweaking I, I think again you'll know um, what I the watch I can say more of the watch outs um, I think the reason there are so many chief marketing officers that that change out I think they, they the average is two or three years. Mm. Um, is because usually um, there, there hasn't been patience, um, and so a new one comes in, new one comes in, says, hey, let's do a new campaign. New CEO often comes in. The CEO's tenure now is about five to eight years. New, I, I'm new, so let's have a new campaign. Those are the wrong reasons to do it. I say that having been part of that at GE, <laughs> so I'm mindful of that. Uh, we changed out our tagline. It was an amazing tagline. We bring Amen. good things to life. Probably one of the most iconic, yep. certainly in GE's history. Yep. Um, but it didn't resonate anymore, especially with employees. We came out with imagination at work. Yeah. It was never as iconic as we bring good things to life, but there were different goals we had in mind. So I'd say, um, it, what are you trying to accomplish? For us, it was motivating employees. It was to try to get a new message around innovation and technology and connect employees with customers. And the old message, we couldn't figure out how to make it work. In our case, too many people thought it just meant light. We bring good right, things to light. To light and see. that GE was a lighting company. And we were going so much beyond that. So sometimes your messaging can stand in your way and you need to deal with that too. I will tell you, we, we looked at redoing the whole logo and it just felt wrong. So we were willing to entertain it, but you have to trust your gut on some of those. You're just like, mm, no, that's not gonna work. We're gonna go back to the book on in chapter three, page 69, Discovery. Discovery is about engaging the world as a classroom to extract the ideas that will create the future as quoted from Beth's book. Question, you know, just the mere mention of Discovery, you know, makes your eyes, uh, you know, just look up, you know, it, it's, it's so empowering. What are your tips on how to jumpstart a discovery process? Well, per first of all, I think everyone needs a discovery practice. Uh, I'm a big believer that I don't care what your job is in your company, your job now includes change. It should be part of your job responsibilities. And how are you going to keep up with change if you're not out discovering where change is happening? Now, as soon as I say this, people are going to be saying, yeah, but you don't know my job. You don't know how busy I am. And you're right, I don't, but I know how busy work is. <laughs> and uh, to me, discovery is just one of the joys of work and a joy of living. Um, and so I think you make a practice of it, meaning you put yourself out in the world, you go to where things are maybe weird, where different things are emerging, and you learn about them. I have a simple practice I, I practice and I recommend, I call it going on threes. First time you're out in the world, you, I keep a notebook of interestingness. What's something interesting that I haven't seen before in this situation? Mm -hmm. I'm out in the world, I see it twice. I ask, is this a coincidence? Third time, I just declare it's a trend. I don't need McKinsey to come and certify it. And then with the team, it's like, okay, what do we need to do now? Uh, how can we learn more? You have to bring in thinkers from the outside. It could be as simple as downloading a TED Talk on a topic, going to see a startup or a professor, and challenging yourself of why this trend is going to impact you. And then finally, I'll give your listeners a bit of a challenge. Uh, I'd encourage you and your listeners to think back five or 10 years. What was something that at the time you thought, that is so silly, that is never going to take off, but now is mainstream? I don't know. When I ask you that, Ishak, does something come uh, up? <laughs> I would want to give it some thought yeah. before answering well, on the spot, a, a but couple, there are for sure examples. Yeah, there are like, like maybe yeah. getting in the car with a stranger now on the right. day of ride sharing and Uber right. and Lyft. That's right. Um, kombucha, I mean, organic food, plant-based yeah, meat. Plenty of, uh, there are a number, in, and every industry has those. And at first you want to go, that is so stupid. 
That is so silly. Ha ha ha, it's a joke. I saw it at NBC when we saw streaming video. I saw it at GE when we looked at the future of clean tech coming into the industrial side. Um, I've been around long enough to see that these things take off. So look, I I'm passionate about, as you can tell, there are simple things you can do. You simply must make room for discovery if you're gonna be part of the change that's happening in business. Now, there's only a few minutes left, and this may be uh, a blessing to, to talk about GE's Cape Crusader. What a story. And again, uh, I would encourage the listeners to go out and purchase Imagine It Forward, Courage, Creativity, and the Power of Change. Perhaps you could just uh, talk about how important it is for a company to be open to self-introspection. Yeah, so as I said, you're out discovering, often you have to bring in people who are different than you with opinions different. And so we brought in a cultural anthropologist because we were decided we wanted to sort of psychoanalyze ourselves, our brand, what did employees and customers think. And uh, through P&G, I'd been introduced to a very, in a, in a corporate research context, a non-traditional cultural anthropologist. Uh, he wore a velvet cape, which was very different in a GE context, and he spoke a very different language of a psychologist. And he did incredibly profound research with us, some of the mm -hmm. best research I've ever been associated with. Mm. Um, but it was different, and people were afraid of it. And right. even the results he gave us were uh, hard to grab, but we had to do hard work with that. So my point is, one, you have to open yourself up to people who have different expertise and are different, maybe weird, but then you have to do a lot of work yourself. It, it, someone doesn't come in from the outside and know your culture. They can right. provoke you. Right. But then you have to take those provocations and say, what do we do with this? How might we make this real? So it's a lot of work to take those outside insights and put them through your filter and challenge yourself to, to look at it realistically. Let's talk about taglines. You touched on it earlier. And in page 83 of the book, you even have a, uh, a picture of the blackboard, the GE equation, developing the tagline imagination at work. Perhaps you could share how the tagline came together and some suggestions when a company is crafting their tagline. So out of this uh, <coughs> process we did with uh, Clotaire Reply, who was a cultural anthropologist at the time, came these insights. Uh, and we gathered them together and we put it in a formula because it was a culture of technologists and, and engineers. And so mm -hmm. it was a formula they could identify with. And it was about what did we learn that the culture really values? Mm -hmm. Hard work. We mm -hmm. called it sweat squared, sweat equity. Yeah. What were the things we wanted to get more of? The culture wanted more innovation, more imagination, and everybody wanted to be better connected to customers. So mm -hmm. out came a formula with some of those elements. Um, and we said, we, we're gonna use our imaginations to make our customers go, wow, we're gonna put our imaginations to work. We're gonna think and we're gonna work. And so it, reson it had to resonate with the culture. So I think that's the critical lesson, do your homework. Don't, just because you're in the marketing team and you think something's clever, how do you know? What's it based on? Are you finding words? Like in that case, sweat. Sweat squared was so critical to the culture. Um, so respect that. And then also recognize what are the new things you're trying to bring in and find a way to, to weave those together so that you can bring people from the past to the present to the future. On page 85, also, I just say such a great, I'm going to quote from the book, taglines are not enough, of course. Too often, people use them as clever statements, but never go further. We needed to develop ways to live them, not just to say them. For us, imagination at work became our inspiration. Yeah, I mean, I, it says it all, but I guess, what are what are what is your suggestion on how a company can ensure that it becomes the mantra, the rallying cry of the company, rather than just something that appears on on, on a business card? Right. Well, the company does have to lead it. I, as I said earlier, I don't believe taglines are as effective today, given the cluttered world. But they're incredibly effective. I mean, in terms of just having people hear your tagline, but in terms of rallying your employees around the culture. It was a way to say, we are uh, creating the future, built on the past. Um, we're gonna use our imaginations and we're gonna sweat like crazy. And we went so far working with the HR department to come up with um, performance reviews that started to measure people. Imagination was one of the things that wow. managers were, imagine, were, were evaluated on. External focus. Uh, are they understanding where trends are happening? Customer focus. Are we living what we're saying? Um, so I think there are a number of ways you can make it actionable 
And that is, to me, was a really great example. Hold people accountable for modeling those behaviors. Beth, the time flies on the set. <laughs> We're out of time, just a quick 60 seconds. Perhaps you could share any final takeaways for the listeners of Mind Your Business. Well, I think based on what we've said today, I, I think, think, think long and hard about what's your story. Um, and people can help you tell it, but everyone, every business has a story. And you're going to be able to sell what you do better if you can tell your story. It's a tenet I have. You can't sell anything if you can't tell it. And so I hopefully today we've unlocked some of that. And I think it starts with discovery. I, I believe to keep pace with change, you have to make room for discovery. I love the honor of interviewing C-level executives and sharing their great advice and perspective on Mind Your Business. I'd love to get your feedback. Post it in the comments below and subscribe. You'll never miss an edition of Mind Your Business.